Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am delighted to have uh, Muriel McMahon back. She's a Zurich trained uh, Jungian analyst who really has delved deeply into fairy tales. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. The format is Muriel is going to make a presentation. Please use pen and paper to keep track of all the great questions that you have. After the presentation, we will take all your questions. I will organize them from the broadest to the narrowest, and we're going to go through uh, all of them. All right, so let's get started. Muriel, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. It's delightful to be back with this group. I've been uh, in your company a few times, and so I responded to the invitation to dive a little bit deeper into fairy tales. I think last time we did it, we just touched, touched the service. So I'm gonna to begin to try to constellate the field. So this is a wonderful uh, fragment of a poem by Shel Silverstein. So if you are a dreamer, come in. If you are a dreamer, a wisher, a liar, a hoper, a prayer, a magic bean buyer. Oh, if you're a pretender, come sit by my fire. For we have some flax golden tails to spin. Come in come in, for we have some flax golden tails to spin. Come in. All right, so hopefully we've constellated the field and at least the fairies and the trolls are dancing on the edges. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you a paper that I've written, which I think really um, introduces and highlights um, what I feel is so essential in our times. Um, we've been told that to resurrect the fairy tale is to uncover that hidden wisdom that the fairy tales contain. So Marie-Louise von Franz, who you may or may not know was Jung's, probably his closest student, his deepest collaborator, and a brilliant woman in her own right, she is said to have analyzed 30,000 fairy tales. I think she said that because Jung said he analyzed 29,000 dreams. So she had to one up the old man and say, but I have analyzed 30,000 fairy tales. At least that's the story on the street. I don't know if it's true or not. So I'm going to, I'm going to present this paper, which does include some poetry and it does include a fairy tale. And then hopefully we can see where that touched you, where that moved you and why, as Jack Sipes says, we have to become grave diggers. We have to dig up the remote past and vivify it for our times. So the, the, um, the title of my paper is called The Mushroom Hunters. So imagine if you will, that fairy tales are like mushrooms. They have secrets, they have seasons. They are our teachers. Poet and storyteller Neil Gaiman knows this. Science, as you know, my little one, is the study of the nature and the behavior of the universe. I fear there is a gross misunderstanding operating in the Western psyche, a misunderstanding that has been replicated for generations. As far back in literature as I'm able to understand, from Gilgamesh forward to the Marvel movies, the walls of Uruk with the temple of the goddess imprisoned within the center of the city, the inflation of the archetypal masculine heroic has left our planet in peril. It has left us flooded with the profane and hungering for the sacred. When asked what to do when the walls crumble, when the flood waters rise, we are told, build an ark, save the seeds. The flood waters are rising. When we learn in the epic tale, Gilgam Gilgamesh, that the temple is within the city walls, that Enkidu is the stranger on the outside. The separation of human and nature is almost complete. 
this overdeveloped masculine or yang understanding of the nature and the behavior of the universe is one-sided. This misunderstanding needs to be rectified. We need to find our way back to enchantment. Maybe it's better or more precise to say there was a gross misalignment in the West. We are told by the Western thinkers, philosophers, and scientists, perhaps speaking in Descartes' mind-body dualism, that we are separate from what we study, observe, quantify, and formulate. Supposedly, what makes us human is the mind, the capacity to think. I think, therefore I am. Descartes' world can be quantified, classified, reduced, controlled, and mastered. Science, as you know, my little one, is the study of the nature and the behavior of the universe. It is based on observation, on experiment and measurement and the formulation of laws to describe the facts revealed. From Jung and his promotion of the concept of participation mystique as applied to the primitive, through Eric Neumann and his Euroboros, onward to Richard Tarnas and his primal or archaic period, this participation mystique concept denotes a particular kind of psychological connection with objects and concludes in the fact that the subject can be clearly distinct can clearly distinguish himself from the object but is bound to it by a direct relationship which amounts to a partial identity this concept applied to the primitive is what i call the gross misalignment and I believe it skewers our collective capacity to fully express archetypal patterns. The unconscious is surely feminine, but the feminine or yin is not totally unconscious. What we have in these theories of participation mystique is at best the observation of behavior from the outside looking in. It is at its worst, a law formulated in response to the trauma of separation and a complex, a collective complex mistaken as objective truth. In the West, I believe we are operating less as a culture and more as a cultural syndrome or a cultural complex. Science, as you know, my little one, is the study of the nature and the behavior of the universe. It is based on observation, on experiment and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe the facts revealed. Oh, in the old times, they say that men came already fitted with brains designed to follow flesh beasts at a run to hurtle blindly into the unknown, and then to find their way back home when lost with a slain antelope to carry between them, or on bad hunting days with nothing. We are surely lost. We too need to find our way home. Nature is home. In the words of the polymath Jean Gebser, nature is our ever present origin. Not that we are in nature, but rather we are nature. The so-called primitive participation mystique or the Euroboros or the primal period when viewed from inside looks remarkably different. Come with me to the inside. Most would argue that the hero's path has reached its zenith. Young knew this and spoke of it later in his life. He commissioned his descendants, that's us, 
he commissioned his descendants to take up the task of the sacred marriage, the divine conjunctio. This, I believe, is Marie-Louise Marie von Franz's idiom, featured in volume three of her collected works. She called it the maiden's quest. Not maiden as in innocent virgin, but more in the parlance of Jungian analyst Marion Woodman as the pregnant virgin, the handmaid of emergence, the belonging to no man, to no structure. Science, as you know, my little one, is the study of the nature and the behavior of the universe. It is based on observation, on experiment and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe the facts revealed. In old times, they say that men came already fitted with brains to des design to follow flesh beasts at a run, to hurtle blinding into the unknown, and then to find their way back home when lost with a slain antelope to carry between them. Or on bad hunting days, nothing. The women who did not need to run down prey had brains that spotted landmarks and made paths between them. Left at the torn brush and across the scree and looked down in the bowl of the half fallen tree because sometimes there are mushrooms. In an international best-selling book, Merlin Sheldrake, like the women in our game and poem, has taught us to discover mushrooms. And I believe this too can teach us to rediscover the enchanted world of fairy tales. Entangled Life discusses how fungi make our world, change our minds, and shape our future. There are patterns in the natural world. There are patterns to discover in fairy tales, archetypal patterns. My husband, Butch, and I live on a hundred acre wood in West Gray, Ontario, Canada. Our property is called Fox Haven by the previous owners, and it seemed fit to keep, so we, we kept the name. In our first week on the land, I encountered red foxes in the pine forest, and I took this as a blessing. As stewards of Fox Haven, we are learning to attend and attune to the land. When we first visited the property as potential buyers, I left a tobacco bundle in the bowl of St. Francis, a cement garden statue at the edge of the forest. I left two small bundles of black and white cotton holding sacred tobacco and tied with rainbow ribbons. I am taught by the wisdom keepers of Six Nations that the black cotton represents the dark forces of nature. The white cotton represents the lighter forces of nature. The sacred tobacco is the contract we of the earth make with great spirit. And the rainbow ribbons represent the faces of the unborn. As an aside, or, or maybe not, maybe as a quick pattern read, it is forever interesting to me that the plants that are sacred to the indigenous of the land often become substances of addiction to the colonizers. Tobacco, coffee, chocolate. In this case, I did not want to come as a colonizer. I also think that applies to our approach to fairy tales. Making my offering to Foxhaven, I asked the spirits of the land, the traditional keepers of the land, the Anishinaabe, to bless our intention and to find us worthy. It was not an easy purchase. Missteps and drop threads and daringly foolish risks. And if not for the steadfast faith that the land was beckoning, even when it looked as if the cards were stacked against us. In September of 2019, we became the stewards of Foxhaven. Our first year was all about learning to know what was planted in the over one, one dozen flower gardens, 
know the over 20 kilometers of trails that were cut through meadow and forest and to tend to the repair and the restoration needs of our home. Well, it was not enough to know the names of the flowers or the trees, we needed to observe the blooming, the pruning needs, the mulching and the fertilizing expectations. As amateur gardeners and arborists, we quickly learned to come into a right relationship with Foxhaven and that which was already cultivated. We learned to walk without a trace. We learned to observe, experiment, and measure. We learned nature's laws. Oh, the way the snow drifts, the wetlands and its seasons, when to keep the dogs away from what we learned the hard way was the porcupines. Why not to feed the birds and attract the red squirrels? Where to place the hummingbird feeders and how to call the trees away from the power lines? Oh, and when the wild turkeys emerge like ghosts from the foggy woods. Science, as you know, my little ones, is the study of the nature and the behavior of the universe. It's based on observation, on experiment and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe the facts revealed. In the old days, they say that men came fitted with brains designed to follow flesh beasts at a run, to hurtle blinding into the unknown, and went to find the way back home when lost with a slain antelope to carry between them or on bad hunting days, nothing. The women who did not need to run down prey had brains that spotted landmarks and made paths between them. Left at the torn thorn bush and across the scree and looked down in the bowl of the half fallen tree because sometimes there are mushrooms. Before the flint club or the flint butcher's tools, the first tool of all was a sling for the baby to keep our hands free and something to put the berries and the mushrooms in, the roots and the good leaves, the seeds and the crawlers. Well, that first year in October, we hosted our family for a Canadian Thanksgiving. Oh, the trees were a blazing color, russet, gold, purple, copper. The sky was blue and the sun was warm against the gathering October winds. Oh, we were grateful for all that had placed in our, we were grateful for all that had been placed in our stewardship. And we were eager to share the abundance. In fun loving Canadian style, we all dressed in blue jeans and plaid flannel shirts. The iconic photos adorn our family room walls. We laughed and we feasted and we introduced Foxhaven to our loves. As is customary with my family, we told stories and we shared fairy tales. Well, on the morning of the second day, my brother, now a Texan, took a solitary walk. When he hadn't returned in an hour, we began to wonder. In the next hour, we had begun to worry. About 20 minutes later, we received a cell phone distress call. He was lost. He was lost in the tornado forest. About 10 years ago, a tornado touched down in the forest on the southern edge of the property. It is still today a twisted forest of limbs and trunks and brush. My brother was lost in this vortex of wood, lost in a complex tangle of deadfall. We sent the dogs to find him. We honked the horns on the car so he could hear them and chart the direction toward home. We called out, we told him to sing. We tried to locate him on the GPS before his phone battery died. Finally, Butch sent us all back to the house to wait and he took to tra tracking. 
Taught by Tom Brown Jr., my husband is skilled in reading the ever so subtle patterns left on the land. In 20 minutes, the rescue was complete. They both returned safely. We marveled at how well Butch was able to track my brother into and out of the twisted wood. When technology and noise and worry had failed us, reading the patterns of nature proved most effective. I can only hope to be that good at reading patterns in my analytical office when the vortex of a complex gets dense. I can only hope to give you the tools to read a fairy tale for the wisdom they contain. Everything leaves a trace, a footprint, a pattern. That is how well Butch had come to know the land and how we can learn to read the inscape, the archetypal field, even the land of enchantment. We have since blazed the trees with orange ribbon so that summer or winter, the way home is marked. We also, by utility, renamed the trails. There is St. Francis Way, the Ramp Route, the Monarch Meadows, the Porcupines, Rock Lake, etc. And no one goes on a hike without leaving a hike plan and hoisting a day pack with emergency supplies. Science, as you know, my little ones, is the study of the nature and the behavior of the universe. It is based on observation, on experiment and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe the facts revealed. In old times, they say that men came already fitted with brains designed to follow flesh beasts at a run, to hurdle blinding into the unknown, and then to find their way back home when lost with a slain antelope to carry between them, or on bad hunting days, nothing. The women who did not need to run down prey had brains that spotted landmarks and made paths between them, left at the thorn bush and across the scree and looked down in the whole bowl of the half fallen tree because sometimes there are mushrooms. Before the flint club or the flint butcher's tools, the first tool of all, was a sling for the baby to keep our hands free and something to put the berries and the mushrooms in, the roots and the good leaves, the seeds and the crawlers. Then a flint pestle to smash, to crush, to grind or break. And sometimes men chased the beasts into the deep woods and they never came back. Some mushrooms will kill you while some will show you gods and some will feed the hunger in our bellies. Identify, identify, identify. That first year at Foxhaven, we forged for puffballs. These are mushrooms that range in size from softball to volleyball. And Butch taught me how to find them, when to pick them, how to sustain the mycelia so that we took only what we needed. Daniel Quinn in his wonderful trilogy, beginning with Ishmael says, surplus is the bane of the indigenous way. I was taught that in the indigenous languages of the people of Turtle Island, there is no word for the number four. There is a word for one, for two, and for three, four is translated as one more than three and five is two more than three. Three is all I can hold in my hands. More than three of anything must be shared. If I hold the surplus, if I create grain elevators to hold the surplus, the power complex creeps in. He who holds the surplus holds the power. This is the bane of the indigenous way. This is how we begin to lose the sacred. Many have claimed that the indigenous way was primitive, that there was an identification with the unconscious that resists individuation. I and others disagree. 
The principle of the indigenous way is reciprocity. As soon as the split between the human and the natural world is suffered, as soon as the seed is put in the ground and fenced off from the deer and the rabbits, as soon as the hogans and huts replace nomadic teepees, the indigenous way is eroded. In our conscious industry and mastery over nature, there is lurking a lack of faith that nature will provide what we need. There is a lack of willingness to read the patterns and to follow the salmon or the caribou. There is a spiritual and physical malaise that sets in. We are nature and nature is us. When we stand apart from this interconnectedness, reciprocity is the first casualty. In our history as Canadians, one of the first thing that the colonizing government did was to ban the ceremony of the potlatch. This ceremony of reciprocity was not understood from the outside. By banning it, the spirit of the people was colonized along with the land. Loss of spirit, enforced belief in the illusion that secular institutions will provide and replace what has previously been honored as sacred, separation of us from one another into reservations or ideologies, that is the final solution. It happened. It keeps on happening. In our second year at Foxhaven, oh, I found the morals. These fungi are known as the champagne of mushrooms. My morning walkabout was teaching me to observe. Tom Brown Jr. taught my husband Butch how to observe, how to watch the mice tracks to know where the owl nested, how to read the fractals and leaf to know which bark yielded which wood, how the number of rings in a long whispered which wood would be, sorry, how the number of rings in a long whispered which wood would was best to burn in the shoulder season and which was best to burn when the temperatures dip below 45 degrees Celsius. In my own observations, I learned to watch the cycle of the moon and the rain and the wood. Like the undulating patterns of the mushroom itself, the morales told me its season. Some might call this the signature of plants. One day there would be nothing. The next day, after a full moon, after the rain, after the first of June, the morels invited my fingers and my basket. Have you ever tasted a newly harvested morel? Ah, it's wonderful. Alas, there were no morels this year. I watched the patterns, the rains, the date, I checked the usual places along the di ditches next to the hardwood. Had I over harvested? Had we unknowingly offended the spirits of the land? Is there a cycle that we had yet to observe? What story were the morels telling us this year by their elusiveness? Oh, how we miss the fruits of our foraging. So, Butch made a mushroom garden. In our greenhouse, he grew and harvested angel hair mushrooms. Underneath the oak tree, he spread out the mycelia and made a red wine cap mushroom garden. The angel hair mushrooms bloomed and we ate well. Still no morals. The red wine cap bloomed and we ate well. Still no morals. We had become mushroom farmers, not foragers. I ate my farmed mushrooms and I wept for this seemingly lost enchantment of our forest. I hungered more for them because of their absence. Then, walking in the forest with a belly full of farmed mushrooms, I happened upon a fairy ring. What are fairy rings? Fairy rings are mushrooms that appear in a circular formation, 
usually in forests or grassy areas. They have been associated with the presence of fairies, of elves, and are thought to be good luck or bad luck, depending on the tradition. When a mushroom spore lands in a suitable location, the underground fungus roots grow out evenly in all directions. As the fungus grows and ages, the oldest parts in the center create a circle. When the fungus produces its mushrooms, the fruiting bodies, they appear above ground in a ring. Given that the fungus does not die when the mushrooms fade, a fairy ring can persist for many years and continually increase in size. One enormous fairy ring in France is thought to be over 700 years old. These mushroom rings are thought to be the portals to the world of enchantment. They are known to be the fairy's dancing place which takes us to an Irish fairy tale. Lanty McClusty had married a wife. And of course it was necessary to have a house in which to keep her. Now Lanty had taken a bit of farm about six acres, but there was no house on it and he resolved to build one and that it might be comfortable as possible. And he selected the site of one of those beautiful green circles that are supposed to be the playground of the fairies. Well, now Lanty was warned against this, but as he was a headstrong man and not much given to fear, he said that he would not change such a pleasant situation for his house to oblige all the fairies in Europe. He accordingly proceeded with the building, which he finished off very neatly and as was usual on these occasions to give one's neighbors and friends a housewarming. So in compliance with his good and pleasant old custom, Lanty having bought, brought home the wife in the course of the day, got a fiddler and a lot of whiskey, and he gave those who had come to see him a dance in the evening. Well, this went all very well. And the fun and the hilarity were proceeding briskly, when a noise was heard after night had set in, like the crushing and the stranging of ribs and rafters at the top of the house. The folks assembled all listened and without doubt, there was nothing heard but crushing and heaving and pushing and groaning and panting as if a thousand little men were engaged in pulling down the roof. Come, said a voice which spoke in the tone of a command. Work hard, you know, we must have Lanty's house down before midnight. Well, this was an unwelcome bit of intelligence to Lanty, who finding that his enemies were such as he could not cope with, walked out and addressed them as follows. Oh, gentlemen, I humbly ask you pardon for building on any place belonging to you. But if you'll have the servitude to let me alone this night, I will begin to pull down and remove the house tomorrow morning. Well, this was followed by a noise like the clapping of a thousand tiny little hands and a shout, Bravo, Lanty! Build halfway between the two white thorns above the boreen. And after another hearty little shout of exultation, there was a brisk rushing noise and they were heard no more. The story, however, does not end there. For Lanty, when digging the foundation of his new house, found the full pot of gold, so that in leaving the fairies to their playground, he became a richer man than he was otherwise would have been. And he never came into contact with them at all. So as our protagonist Lanty McClustery discovered, there is in nature, in us, a right way and a wrong way to encounter both the sacred and the profane. When we stumble into the right way, when we make repair even when th with things we do not totally understand, 
oh, that world of enchantment opens up to us. Is there a better pot of gold than that? In these fractious times, in these times of transition, when the world, like Lanty's house, seems to be shaking, when the rafters of all that we have built threaten to fall, we need to become, as, Zach's, as Jack Sipes entreats, we need to become grave diggers. We need to become, as Neil Gaiman demonstrated, mushroom hunters. We need to dig into the remote past. We need to unearth the mycelium or the archetypal networks and unearth the stories that will show us the way. We need to find the fairy rings again. Science, as you know, my little ones, is the study of the nature and the behavior of the universe. It is based on observation, on experiment and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe the facts revealed. In the old times, they say, that men came already fitted with brains designed to follow flesh beasts at a run, to hurdle blinding into the unknown, and then to find their way back home when lost with a slain antelope to carry between them. Or on bad hunting days, nothing. The women who did not need to run down prey had brains that spotted landmarks and made paths between them left at the thorn bush and across the scree and looked down in the bowl of the half fallen tree because sometimes there are mushrooms. Sometimes there are fairy tales. Before the flint club or the flint butcher's tools, the first tool of all was a sling for the baby to keep our hands free and something to put the berries and the mushrooms in, the roots and the good leaves, the seeds and the crawlers. Then a flint pestle to smash and crush, to grind or break. And sometimes men chase beasts into the deep woods and they never come back. Some mushrooms will kill you and some will show you gods. And some will feed the hunger in our bellies, identify. Others will kill us if we eat them raw and kill us again if we cook them once. But if we boil them up in spring water and pour the water away and then boil them once more and pour the water away, only then can we eat them safely. Observe. Identify, observe, observe childbirth, measure the swell of bellies and the swell of breasts, and through experience, discover how to bring babies safely into our world. Observe everything. And the mushroom hunters walk the ways they walk and watch the world and see what they observe and some of them will thrive and lick their lips while others clutch their stomachs and expire. So laws are made and handed down on what is safe. Formulate, identify, observe, formulate. The tools we make to build our lives, our clothes, our food, our path home, all things we base on observation, on experiment, on measurement, on truth. And science, you remember, is the study of the nature and the behavior of the universe based on observation, experiment, and measurement and the formulation of laws to describe these facts. The race continues. And early scientists drew beasts upon the walls of caves to show her children, now all fat on mushrooms and on berries, 
what is safe to hunt. The men go on running after beasts. The scientists walk more slowly over the brow of the hill and down to the water's edge and past the place where the red clay runs. They are carrying their babies in the slings they made, freeing their hands to pick mushrooms, freeing our hands to study fairy tales. Oh, wonderful. Uh, that was wondrous, simply wondrous. Thank you. I hope it took you a bit into the into the field of enchantment. Yes, yes. <laughs> it took us into two different fields, and the field of the the fox meadow, uh, uh, and enchantment, and the connections between the two. It was just beautiful, beautiful. All right, folks. So um, it's time for questions. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark. I have plenty of questions, but your, your questions take a uh, priority. So go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat if you would like to ask questions. Um, what we're going to do is that we're going to collect all the questions and then we're going to, I'm going to organize all of them and then we will pose it to Muriel one at a time. The broadest ones first and the more specific ones. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you have questions. Uh, we're going to start with, uh, let me see here. Give me just a second. Hold on. Uh, yes, uh, let's start with uh, George followed by Roma. George, what's your question? Thank you, Shukant. Uh, Muriel, yes, that was wonderful. My question is you refer to tobacco and coffee and mushrooms. Now, are you suggesting, because in my experience, um, I, I, I actually do cannabis, I don't do mushrooms, but my question is like, do you believe that our world has become very reductionist, very scientific at the expense of spirituality that nature bestows upon us through these agents? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, that I, I, I have worked with many people who have um, uh, taken mushroom journeys or are micro dosing. And it, if anything, it seems to be reconnecting them to nature itself. So the further we have become disenfranchised from our nature, from the fact that we are in nature, I would say that some of these things um, do open up that portal. The point that I made about coffee and chocolate and tobacco is that when these vehicles of ecstasy, and that's what um, Eliade called them, when these vehicles of ecstasy are removed from the context of a spiritual quest, then it's like they approximate. It's like you get close to it, but you don't quite get it. So you need to go again and you need to go again. And then the next thing you know that you are addicted. Now that doesn't seem to be the case with cannabis and it doesn't seem to be the case with mushrooms. But I think we have to always say, am I going into the unconscious as a tourist because I just wanna have a really interesting trip? Or am I truly on a spiritual quest to come into a fullness of my own nature? And I think that's where Gaiman's poem is so lovely to say, sometimes you go in and you get lost and you can't come back. Or sometimes that world of enchantment is so alluring. I worked with a man one time who was doing um, um, ayahuasca. He was a member of the Sante Dami Church, and he was regular, regularly doing these ayahuasca trips. And his experiences were profound. They were, as the analyst, I, I really looked forward to what he would bring into the hour. But then I watched what started to happen and that the, the world he was going to 
was more alluring and had more um, uh, gravity in his psyche than the world he was living with. So at one point I said to him, I don't think we can continue to work together if you are using ayahuasca. I said, what I want you to do is to finish your degree, get into a relationship and move out of your mother's basement. If you do those things, then you will have enough grounding in consensual reality to be able to bring some of what you were learning back. And he agreed and that's what he did. And then I worked with him 20 years later and he was, it was amazing. He was an amazing, you know, he, he had, he had, he took me seriously and grounded himself in reality and then went on a spiritual journey and it, he's living a very rich life. So Wonderful. that's my caution, George. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Folks, go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to ask questions. Next up is Roma. Roma, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. I, I popped in on this um, forum and I really did not expect this. So thank you, Muriel. I, I had a question. It's something that you brought up, brought up uh, over again in your speech and it's the observe, identify and formulate. And I was wondering if you can give uh, be a little bit more information on what do you mean by observe and identify and what are the difference between observing and identifying? Okay, that's an excellent question, uh, uh, Roma. The idea that observe, I think, is where you don't cast judgment. It's like you make a bowl big enough to hold it all and you don't necessarily immediately make those connections. So it's like a yin energy of receptivity. Identify is when you take those, those constituents and you form them into a theory. You know, it's, so it's like I could have um, pieces of wood and I observe that I have, oh, that wood seems to be useful horizontally. And that one seems to be useful vertically. And that one is, is quite wide and flat. So I'm observing that. I don't know what it is. And then I identify this is a chair. So that multiplicity coalesces into my identification that this is chair. So I've somehow identified the essence. So when I look at a chair at a table, I know it's a chair, but I can also look at a chair without a back and know it's a chair. And I can look at something with three legs and still call it a chair. What gives there? How does that identifying hold up against observation? It's because I've got to the function. And so observe, identify, and then the formulate, I think, brings us to what's, what's its function? What does it do? What's its purpose? And we have to be bringing that idea of function to the forms, or we're spinning off in fairyland, or we're caught in the dense matter with no sense of enchantment. So it's an excellent question. And I think with fairy tales, we can do that. They're good stories for God's sake. You just listen to them, you read them and they're great stories. You don't do like, remember in, um, in grade 11 English where the teacher would take a poem and, and basically dissect it across the blackboard and you name the metaphors and the similes and the alliteration and you destroy the beauty of the poem. So the idea that the fairy tale is first and foremost a great story, and then it's an enduring story. So you begin to wonder, why is this so enduring? Why has it lasted so long? And why is the same story being told in so many different cultures? So what you're doing there is you're beginning to get a sense of its purpose and its function. Wonderful. Um, next up is going to be Joe, followed by Madeline. Joe, go ahead. Um, you know, thank you, Meryl. Uh, it, it's, that was amazing. It really is. I mean, to, to read that whole story like that and so beautifully, uh, that, that's, that's, it, it was really truly a treat to all of us. I was wondering um, if you could expand a little bit on the idea of what you mean by sacred and profane. Because uh, I'm kind of, I have a basic understanding of that from Emile Durkheim. 
but I don't know if it's the same thing where the profane is the something of the mundane, the everyday experience that we have and the sacred is something that transcends that. Is that something along the lines of where you were going with this idea or is it, am I totally off? Yeah, I would, no, I'd say you're right on. I, I don't think I could define it any better. Maybe I can just rip on that and say that, you know, spirit and matter, you know, so that what is sacred often lifts us out of the mundane, you know, that that is what's sacred. It's like time collapses in that moment, the anamnesis of the mass and whoa, something, something opened up there. But the profane is the fact that it, it, is, it is of matter. So I think what Jung was, was ascribing to our generation is the divine marriage between the sacred and the profane. That one is not chosen so that we see the spirit in matter and matter in spirit. Jung got so excited at the doctrine of the assumption of the virgin, the assumption of Mary because he saw that as matter being lifted up to the, the to be sacred. And it wasn't just the uplifting of the feminine, though God knows we need that, but it was also the idea that that spirit and matter and matter in spirit. So if how many angels can dance on the head of a needle is your spiritual musing, what so what? You know, like it has to come into like like my my client, like get out of your mother's basement, finish your degree, you know, like make something of your life. And then you've got something to bring those spiritual musings and those spiritual experiences. And then you're more likely to have that divine conjunctio. I think the split is when we we say, you know, OK, this, this, the sacred doesn't exist. I'm an atheist. There is nothing. Or when we just, we, we deny matter and anything of matter is somehow disparaged because we want to fly into flights of, of fancy. So it really is the marriage between the two. Beautiful. Thank you. Next up is uh, Madeline. Folks, uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to ask questions. Madeline, go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks. This is utterly delightful. Uh, I'm having a wonderful time, and I, I love your storytelling style. Uh, there are a couple of things that strike me. One is uh, that much of what uh, you're talking about with what the more ancient peoples were doing is, in fact, science. It is observing, it is describing, it's comparing, it's identifying, and it's experimenting. So I think that the science uh, that we're probably all thinking of in contrast to that kind of life is the science that's embedded in the military industrial society of the spectacle complex. And I get the sense from you that um, if we look at that as the world, say the world of the woods, maybe the world of the deadfall, uh, that we can look around and see that we might be able to find one mushroom in a fairy ring and start tracing our way around. I was wondering if that's your, your analogy, that there's something deeper underneath. And I was wondering if you could just expand on your perspective about uh, the societal complexes we have going on right now. Okay, sure. <laughs> How much time do we have? No, I, I'm teasing you, Madeline. Um, that I agree that that the split between um, the science, science as we knew it back in the day and science as we know it today. I mean, I think that's what needs to be healed. You know, that um, with this, I don't know about where you're from, but certainly in Canada, the cry of the public health is trust the science, don't question the science, the science is the God. And I'm thinking that goes against what science is. You know, you need to be able to dialogue, you need to be able to question, you need to be able to observe, and you need to be able to see how it applies to your life. So I think the point that I'm making is the science that's embedded in these fairy stories will save us 
if we can if we can find it if we can see the patterns because these these deeply psychological patterns that are necessary in order to deal with the strife of our times i mean it's it's in the fairy stories themselves and to go to the second question, I hope that answers your question about um, my understanding of science or my definition of science as, as you know, um, the ancient peoples or the primitive peoples. Okay, the, and then the second question, this is where I would plant my flag, <laughs> although that sounds very colonizing, but this is where I would plant my flag. I would say we're in the end times. We've been in them before and we're gonna be them in, a, in them again. That the old structures that have held us are crumbling and we are on the cusp of emergence. However, we also know from the ancient stories that the firstborn of emergence is usually an abomination. It's usually a giant. It's usually something that we should be afraid of. Yet it does need to be born. So it does need to emerge. And then it needs to somehow be, be tamed or domesticated or understood. What I, I think we are in apocalyptic times. But my fear is this, that we're just going to tear down to build up. And I don't think that that's the answer. The fairy tales will tell us the old king must die, long live the king. The old queen must die, long live the queen. The best story for our times, I believe, is a Norwegian story called Tatterhood, because it's such a story of emergence and when she emerges in the fullness of her strength, she teaches the masculine how to address her, how to relate to her. And so at the end of the tale, we have the divine conjunctio. We have the marriage of the old order and the new order, the masculine and the feminine, the, the sacred and the profane. So I think we're in apocalyptic times. So we need to read fairy stories to say, and how did they how did they make it through? Because here we are, they've made it through. There have been, you know, Constantinople, case in point. Wonderful. Um, I'm gonna ask one question. Um, we have Evanique and Brian at our meetup doing a series on the divine feminine, because we found that, you know, we've been studying spirituality. And we've noticed exactly the same pattern that Jung talks about in the answer to Job, that yeah. Mary is not given the proper place. And the Anansi, you know, kind of making, you know, bringing her up to heaven is the right thing. So we, in our own way, are trying to do that. Like each month, um, you know, Evanique and Brian, they are going through this. Uh, so I want to... Uh, pass it to Evanique and have her talk a little bit about what we are doing, because that's a way that we, what we are doing here in 52 Living Ideas is trying to bring that back. So Evanique, could you talk just a little bit about um, the series and, uh, you know, I, I would have uh, Muriel comment on that. Sure. So the series that like, she described it perfectly. We're doing a series on a divine feminine and we're studying different goddesses of different er areas. Uh, that was it? No, it was earlier this month, actually. We did, um, we started off with Isis. Well, first I started off with masculine and feminine energy just to provide the framework. And what I noticed is that masculine is more structured and feminine is, for lack of a better word, I don't want to say chaotic. It's not create. It's more creative. It's more like water going with the flow, whereas male is more structured. And what I wanted to emphasize is that we need both, right? You, you need both in order to function and be well balanced. Um, and that masculine and feminine energies are not necessarily gender related. So there's some men that can exhibit more of a feminine feminine qualities or feminine divine. And there's women that can, are more masculine energy or masculine, uh, you know? And so when we study these gods, 
goddesses, we will be studying their counterparts because that's just part of the story. And so the part of the story is that they are stories to teach us something. So the first one we did, for instance, was Isis, uh, Osiris, and um, by way, we discussed Set and Horus. And so Isis is, um, is one of the goddesses we studied and what she did was she recreated life, right? So Osiris died, Set killed her. I'm just paraphrasing, not trying to go into too much detail. And basically it was Set that killed him and, Os and uh, Isis had to put his body together and create a child. And then uh, Osiris went to rule the underworld and Isis uh, ruled up here. And so, um, the thing that she had to do is, she, you know, she brings things together, she brings life. And so the story of Isis is written on Egyptian pyramids and it's taught and it's like specific because when people are going to death or into the underworld, they're going to Osiris. So it's teaching in the story. Now, the question is, is the story like factually true? Probably not, but it's meant, and what it's meant to do is to discuss masculine and feminine quality so that's what the series does and we're still in the next one we're going to study in august it's going to be oshun which is an african goddess which is something that's just not explored as much so i'm looking forward to doing that so that's what we're doing here and that's how we're just that's how we're discussing it so well can i can i comment sure please, please. Um, you know, definitely looking at myths is different than looking at fairy tales because myths are kind of like the collective fairy tales, you know, like it's it's the it's like this is the group, this is archetypal, this is what typically has been across cultures. And um, fairy tales are a little closer to personal psychology rather than collective psychology. So there are all kinds of stories um, in fairy tales. And I'm not suggesting you do this. You're doing what mm -hmm. you're doing with the myths. But the fairy tales also have, you know, like, do not go to Disney. I mean, Disney is, is, is propaganda. Disney is trying to sell a message. If you go to the original stories, you're going to get princesses and witches and ogres and, and old women who eat children. I mean, you're going to get the fullness of the feminine in all her guises. And this is where um, I struggle a little bit with a lot of the return of the goddess kind of um, um, ideology that's out there. And I'm not saying this is what you're doing, just I'm talking about that in general. As if we just make space for the feminine to rise up, for the goddess to return and all will be fixed. No. When she first rises up, she's going to be Kali because she's been held down for so long. The firstborn is not to be revered. She is to be feared. And so I think what we get so many times is what's rising up is that firstborn of creation. So we need to make a container large enough to hold it so that she can, you know, she can come back into relationship. Archetypes are not relational. Archetypes are powerful forces of energy. And we need to create the space and the time and the myths and the fairy tales and the personal dreams will give you a container to say, and what aspect of her is rising right now? in our culture, in our, in our literature, in our dreams. And that's what we need to observe and pay attention to. Because if we're all just looking for that beautiful return of the goddess, she's there, but she's also damn angry. And when she comes out, it's not going to be, um, it's, just, it's not just gonna be unicorns and puppy dogs. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be, I'm going to give chance for people who have not, not asked the question first, and then we'll go to people who are asking a second question. So it's going to be Marco followed by Anne. Marco, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, recommend a, 
a book on fairy tales? Everything and Anything, written by Marie-Louise von Franz. Now, um, Asheville is just releasing the collected works of Marie-Louise von Franz. And what's wonderful about reading her, Marco, is that not only does she do an incredible analysis of the tale, but if you go to the index, that's going to be the best dream dictionary you've ever seen. Because rather than just say, this is what a cat means, or this is what a frog means, what she does is she ties it to a story. So you can see how that operates in the, in the arc of the story itself. So I would strongly recommend um, um, the work of Marie-Louise Montfrance. Uh, let, let me ask a follow-up question. What is the difference between myths and fairy tales in terms of how they operate? What, what's, what's the fundamental difference? What's yeah. similar and what's Just, different? You know, Joseph Campbell said that these are stories that never happened and keep on happening. And so what we get in, um, uh, we, we get the archetypal truths in both myths and in fairy tales. However, the myths have more um, cultural overlay than what the fairy tales do. You know, that you can usually identify in a myth what the geography is, what the time period is, who these people were, what they what they put their hand to where a fairy tale certainly hands christian anderson i mean come on like that's almost like disney you know like he he it, there's wonderful tales there but he's also selling the religious story so his fairy tales are somehow organized in a way to proselytize the christian myth um but the so what i'd say is that Fairy tales are more like the uh, indie movies and the, uh, the myths are like the big screen. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Joe followed by George. Folks, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Joe, go ahead. You know, I, I just in one, what, what we're reading is um, uh, um, right now for, for Young is uh, Modern Man's Search of a Soul. And I feel like actually what you've talked about here this evening actually captures everything in that in in, in what we've uh, what I've read thus far. I have not finished the book, um, but so, you know specifically in talking about what modern man is actually dealing with, you captured in a fairy tale, and it's. Mm -hmm. I just think that that's you know it, it was it's an incredible gift because it's actually clarifies things for me and helping me understand. And you kind of can think of fairy tales as to where we are in our lives as well. And I was just wondering if that was kind of the objective in a way is what you were trying to capture a little bit of what Jung was kind of trying to describe in that book. Yeah, I, I mean, thank you very much for your comments, um, Joe. I, I would agree with you in that, you know, Jung, it's, it's like Jung had the, the, the Christian story, right? And he had the Christian story and he said, like the dead came back from Jerusalem because they found not what they were seeking. So he was saying somehow the Christian story is not addressing the concerns of modern man. He saw it in his father, right? And so he through the black books and the red books is he went into that stratum of the psyche where the fairy tales live and he encountered these figures I mean he encountered when he first saw Salome yes he saw the biblical old testament Salome you you like I didn't even say the words that he called her but he she, it, it wasn't, come on, Solomon, let's sit down and have some tea. And you tell me, he's saying, get away from me. You're evil. You put the head of John the Baptist on the platter. And so what he did is he encountered those images and he began to relate to them. And in relating to them, he brought them into his own life. And so the, the contrast between Salome and Elijah which were the two of the forms he met in the underworld, Salome was blind in Jung's story. 
because the feminine in him was blinded by his intellect, by his thinking function. And he was, Elijah was the Old Testament one who knows. And, and so what he needed to do is to bring those energies closer together. And so how do we find meaning? We find meaning by situa situating ourselves in our stories. I, I have a weekly, I mean, we've ended for the summer, but it was a weekly fairy tale seminar. And I invited some of my students to present as well. And what was so interesting is that the fairy tales found them. There were a couple of instances where a student was presenting on a fairy tale and you could just see that they realized they were telling their deepest truth and their deepest story and it was in the fairy tale and I think that's where it becomes so rich and that's what I hope to do this like Neil Gaiman's poem is like a fairy tale and he certainly um, writes out of that of of that strata of psyche but what I tried to do was to weave in you know, so yeah, some men run into the forest and they don't go back. And I tell the story of my brother, you know, getting lost in the tornado forest. So it's like having that sensibility to look at the world as enchanted and ensouled and to observe what stories come to you. And then if you can situate it in a fairy tale, it gives you some orientation. It tells you whether to turn left or whether to turn right. Wonderful. I want to follow up on uh, Joe's uh, point, because I, I see, you know, I see the echoes of the same themes that Jung is talking about. Um, I mean, the way I think of it is that the Western modern man is focused on the outside. And because he's so focused on the outside, he's not really looking inside his psyche as much. So there is a lot of things inside, which he's not paying attention to. That's one thing. Second thing is that he's so much in love with his transforming power that he's missing the much more deeper, gentler, and more powerful rhythms of nature. By focusing on culture and transforming things outside, he's actually not paying attention to nature. So both yeah. those things, you know, blindness of the inner and blindness of nature is another way of thinking about, you know, not respecting the feminine aspect. You know, Andrew Harvey did some very nice work on that in his work called Sacred Activism. And his point was just that, that if we put all our energy into changing whatever draws us out there, we will become the very thing we are fighting against because we have externalized, we've projected that um, um, Eric Neumann in his wonderful book, Depth Psychology and the New Ethic, he says that was the old ethic and that reached its zenith in Germany. And the modern man has to, the new ethic is to say, if I see it out there, I have to be able to bring it in and say, and even the most heinous things to, to say, and what would it take for me to behave in that manner? That's doing the work. And he says, that is not only going to transform the individual, it is going to transform the culture because it will be from the inside out rather than the outside in. So like Andrew Harvey said, let's say your thing is um, starving children and you are just so touched by wanting to solve the hunger for children. And if you do that in a kind of outwardly directed way, you could keep giving all your resources to the point where your own children are starving. What Andrew Harvey says is whatever draws you, find it in you first. So if I find that hungry child in me and I feed that hungry child, maybe she's not hungry for bread. Maybe she's hungry for fairy tales. And so if I feed that in me, I can still go out with activism, but I'm doing it from a very solid place within. 
And I think that's your point. It's the idea that we have to, you know, uh, the anthropologists were standing outside of the longhouses and saying, this is what we see happening. And even when they were invited in, they still stayed in their Western mindset. I remember being in India and I was in the Mandir, I don't know, thousand people in the Mandir and, and the, the ceremony is over. And then they open up two doors, like one for the men and one for the women. And I'm thinking like, what is wrong with these people? There are 12 doors. Why don't they open up more doors? I was very much in my Western mindset. I was in my animus. I was in my masculine. And then after you're there for a while, you let that go. And what happened is I became aware of the ceremony continued in the way we flowed together and that I was a cell in the body that was India. I wasn't individuated. And then it had a beauty to it, but I needed to find that on the inside because if I stayed outside, then it, 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 it was, I was judging it, so. Wonderful, thank you. Next up is Carmen. Carmen, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Muriel, I was wondering about what you said uh, uh, around awakening the goddess and the rage and the, the anger that uh, can, has been sleeping with it. And I was wondering if it has to do also with the encounter with the witch or the stepmother or I don't know, the, these feminine uh, characters in the fairy tales. And if you can <laughs> elaborate a little bit more around it. Please. Yeah, excellent question, Carmen. My favorite part of teaching the fairy tale courses is when we go to Baba Yaga. You know, we go to the one in the forest that often it's said that the witch, when viewed from the patriarchy, when viewed for all that that wise women represent is is disparaged. So she's considered the witch. And so we project all the darkness of the feminine onto her. And you certainly get that in some of the fairy stories. But if you really look at it as an aspect of the feminine, then you can see there is an aspect of the feminine who works in passive aggressive ways, you know, and would offer the poisoned apple. If we don't know that in ourselves, if we don't know that in the feminine, we're incredibly naive. I worked in um, um, treatment homes with emotionally disturbed, disturbed boys and emotionally disturbed girls and working with the boys was easier. Because if there was a problem, one had a bloody fist and the other had a bloody nose and you knew you had a problem. So then you worked out, okay, let's sort this out. But it was, it was so overt, it was right there. When I worked with emotionally disturbed girls, it was so under the surface, you know? The girl would go into, into the, the dryer and her, her new jeans are there and somebody had poured Javix or bleach on her jeans. So you didn't know who did it. You had to play detective. You had to find out who's mad at who. And then you had to bring it to the surface. So there is something in the feminine that it operates in the dark and it operates in the shadows. And we need to know that. The fairy tales will teach us that. You know, if you look at a character like Baba Yaga, she is so different when the heroine or the maid comes to her versus when the hero comes to her. When the hero comes to her, you know, she says, did you come of your own accord or were you sent? And oh my God, if Ivan answers the question wrong, he's gonna be eaten up. So he refuses to answer it. Oh, woman, make me a cup of tea. You know, like he just, I'm not gonna answer your question. And then in that way, he begins to relate to her in her domain. When the maid comes, she has to do the old woman's bidding. She has to do the laundry and cook the meal. Like she has to be in service to that. So there's, there's such brilliance in that, in that the old order of the feminine, which has been disparaged and the emergent feminine have to come into some kind of harmony and the emergent has to serve the old. It's very different with the hero's journey. So it talks to us, those fairy tales tell us, 
It's not one size fits all. It's not just grab a strat, uh, grab a strategy. And when you meet Baba Yaga in the woods, do this. No, you better be paying attention because the transformation will come when you've had the right attitude. So, so fairy Muriel, tales will tell us a whole lot. Uh, Muriel, I'm going to rephrase uh, Anne's question um, and because this is, again, a very important thing. I really think that Disney as a whole has done a great deal of disservice to, to fairy tales. Um, so just and any thoughts about kind of the, you know, when, because I'm a big fan of going to the original material. And whenever I go to the original material, it, and this applies across the board, but this is actually far more important in fairy tales because those are very short and very powerful. And I find that like later versions of it, not just Disney, but many, many other versions really try to sugarcoat them and you lose like 90% of the value of it. So, and any thoughts about the original yeah, fairy tales and the versions of it? I had a dear friend to me say um, last summer, she said, so what are you doing this fall? And I said, oh, I'm launching this fairy tale series and I'm really looking forward to it. And she says, oh, I read fairy tales to my, she said, I read fairy tales to my granddaughter. And I said, excellent, way to go. And she said, but I censor them. <laughs> what? And she said, well, I can't tell that story. You know, I can't tell Red Riding Hood to a seven year old. And I said, Oh, Ruth, yes, you can. You must. Little girls know that there are wolves in the woods. Little girls know that wolves eat grandmothers. If you don't give them a story to hold it, what is going to become of all that energy? So the problem with Disney, it's always a happy ever after. It's always a love story. The darker elements are toned down. And then we, we have a, a generation of high anxiety. Why? It's because there's no way to feel that, know it, and also know that morning will come. You know, the woodcutter will come. But if you, if you are raised believing it's sugar plum fairies and that's all there is, then what do you do with that energy? It turns in on itself. And then the world becomes a very frightening place, but it's frightening anyway. But it's become frightening and no one's given you a story to name it. Yeah, sound like I'm proselytizing, but oh, that's, that's, like I watch Disney. I watch Disney with my grandkids, you know, and then I tell them the other story. <laughs> oh, no, Comus, that's really scary. You're damn right it is. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean the, the, the point is the, the the negative is part of us. And Absolutely. if you don't face it, it's going to actually in, impact you far more than if you can face it. You know, what these stories do is that they they give you an opportunity of facing it and seeing how it fits and what it is and what its shape is like so you know you can you can deal with that uh, wonderful yeah, it makes you braver because you know those you know those dark aspects in you you know those dark dark aspects in life and then you also know the heroes and the heroines and so you learn how to become braver not how to avoid the monsters because the monsters are there wonderful next let's go with uh, roma roma go ahead um I, I was gonna say as a as a ukrainian and i haven't been in the u.s for that long i can see like a cultural fetishism fetishism towards um uh affirmations towards like uh sort of like new age material like the tarot card reading uh the crystal culture whatever and i was wondering uh, if if these sort of urges to fetishize these things to like um bring fortune kind of play a role in 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 the lack of the fairy tales or the lack of or, or the is it yeah does it play in the censorship of of like a cultural censorship from like the 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 fairy tales and, and other stories. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And I would I would agree that that for for a couple of generations we have been preparing the world for the child. 
rather than preparing the child for the world. And when we sanitize, when we try to hold off telling the story of the darkness, then it becomes this kind of hyper quest for more light, more light. And it does become a kind of a spiritual addiction because it doesn't satisfy, it doesn't have the dark. You know, I remember an art historian telling me about Van Gogh's paintings and the fact that they're so colorful and they have movement. And when you stand in front of an original, like it still holds energy. And what this art historian said is look carefully because you can see where he puts the dark lines in. And the reason they have movement and the reason the color is so vibrant is because he knows how to use the dark. Maybe not in his own life, but certainly on his canvases. So I think that that's the point, that the fairy tales are, you know, I mean, good God, I hear stories. Like when, when kids have to do active shooter drills in their classrooms, and then you're going to censor a fairy story, oh my God, it, it, it just doesn't jive. The world is a scary place. And so they need to know that there are things that can defeat evil. And it's not just some new gun control law or, or, or arming teachers with, with guns. Do you see what I mean? So it's like, we need to come back to something that shows us the light and the dark. And then we can encounter that in the outer world. Uh, I just want to follow up, you know, this is a, one of my pet things. Actually, children are far smarter than what are these adults think that they are. And they are actually able to deal with it because that's what life is. You know, it's all about figuring things out, what is there. And if you tell them lies like this, they actually figure it out. And they think, oh, my, my dad is afraid of talking about it, but I have to figure it out myself. So uh, children are, you know, far more smarter. And they are, and that's yeah. why these fairy tales are as powerful as they are, because they are actually satisfying a genuine need for the child. And part of it, part of it is that we need to, you know, I'm I'm of the um, Jonathan Hyatt belief that we need to have unstructured non-adult time for children. They need to play. They need to play. And in playing, they will encounter these dark forces in themselves. And rather than an adult saying what that means and what you should or you shouldn't do, their peer group does it. And yeah, there is bullying and I'm not downplaying that. That can be absolutely horrific. However, when we go too far the other way and a microaggression is an actual aggression, then we create a world that's just not real. And the kids know it. Right. They know it. And so, you know, they, they, they are closer to the fairy tales than we are. What's that wonderful story that a woman said to Einstein, you know, you're so brilliant. I want my son to be brilliant. What, what should I get him to read? And Einstein said, fairy tales. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, and then what? more fairy tales. You know, like that's, yeah. that's a wonderful story. Yeah. Excellent. Next up is George, followed by Evanique. George, go ahead. Thank you, Shrikant. Um, you're really, yes, and in, in, in terms of feminism, you know, I've been advocating for two de decades for equal male-female, you know, masculine, feminine, feminine representation to inject that feminine into our, you know, governments and all. But I, I want to address you're having basically referred to the end times because anyone who, who knows anything about climate change knows we're in the end times, but, but the difference is that like these end times are happening over decades. And this relates to the issue of fables because like the fables that you know, we've read, you know, they address wolves in present dangers, but we don't, I don't think have a body of new fables to address the new challenge that climate change um, represents. Thank you, George. Uh, go ahead, Muriel, if you would like to comment. 
Well, I think every every generation has its own challenges. You know, I was I watched the wonderful movie Elvis um, last week, and it's so archetypal. It's so well done. And there's a moment in the spoiler alert, y'all know the story. But there's a there's a there's a moment in the movie where Martin Luther King is shot, and then a few clips later, Robert Kennedy is shot. And the feeling is these are the end times. America is absolutely lost its mind and that we are, a, they, they are, I'm not American, but that they are a country in crisis. Well, I would say that climate change when it's called climate crisis, I have a problem. Yes, we do need to address some of the changes is natural and some of the changes accelerated by man's actions. However, when we are in a crisis state, we are in a trauma state and we eclipse our creativity. I wish we would bring the best minds to bear on the fact that there are, there are stories of apocalyptic things that were overcome by ingenuity. I mean, some of the things that the, the characters in fairy tales have to do, you know, like the, it seems absolutely impossible. You'll find a duck under a tree inside of a pig under a tree. Like, you know, it's like, what? It seems so ridiculous, but it's not. It's telling you that you have to bring a creative approach to things that seem debilitating. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give, give a chance for people who have not asked a question to go first. So it's going to be Olga, JP, Evanique, and Madeline. Olga, go ahead. Uh, hi, I am on my phone, and but I don't, I don't put on my video. So I, it's a little bit different question. I, something like maybe 10 years ago, I read a story, real story. Um, about like uh, somewhere in United States, um, uh, granddad took his uh, several uh, grandkids to hike and uh, taught them to be uh, no, um, more, more, let's say more real and more tough in nature, taught them like how they deal with, with real hike. And some people saw it and he did it, of course, for uh, good of his grandkids. And some people saw it and they reported to authorities and they put him to court. Okay. <laughs> Don't you afraid to, to, no, it's a real story. I, I cannot find it right now online, but you could probably find it. It's something like 10 years ago was, it's a real story. And don't you afraid that uh, you can be put, put in court for giving this advice, be more tough with kids, put them in this state. And here in the United States, you could, could get in big trouble for uh, like uh, making kid, kids upset. Okay, uh, let, let me have uh, Muriel respond to that. Thank you, Olga. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the idea that um, grand, I mean, grandparents in the old stories are considered the spiritual parents of the children. And there's more and more research to support that, that mom and dad are so busy trying to keep them fed and clothed and educated that it really is the job of the grandparents to give them that spiritual sensibility. And so this story that Olga shared of a grandfather who wants to do that and then is somehow that goes against the, the zeitgeist of the times and that, no, we have to helicopter parent and protect our children at all costs. I mean, read them fairy stories then. Sit around the campfire and read fairy stories. I mean, I, I've done that with my grandkids and, you know, they get scared and, and they want the light on when I, when I put them to bed and I say, okay, yeah, we'll put a little night light on, but you know, let's check under the bed. Are there monsters? Like let's check in the closet. Are there, well, not tonight. Good thing. You know? So like, I think we have to, Melanie Klein, who was a Freudian, you know, I don't agree with everything Melanie Klein did, but she said, the importance of naming, 
of speaking the truth to children when they're afraid and anxious. And if we try to tell them that there's no such thing as monsters, those monsters go underground. And then they feel they can't talk to mommy and daddy or their teachers about monsters. And then that makes them vulnerable to monsters. So I, I strongly support the idea of giving kids experiences and reading fairy tales and letting them somehow take in with the mother's milk, the archetypal pattern. So when they're challenged, they've got some kind of a whisper, some kind of a memory of, oh, Ivan the foolish, he got out of the problem. Maybe I could too. Yeah, no, great, great point. Um... In, we are uh, on this Thursday, we are going to be reading and discussing Stages of Life by uh, Carl Jung. And one of the points he makes there is that this older generation, they are the keepers of culture. They are the ones who are kind of primarily transmitting these cultural values to their grandchildren. And that's a crucial part. What has happened is that Unfortunately, a lot of the American culture has become kind of subjectivist, feeling oriented. They're more concerned about temporary feeling now about yeah, yeah. something as opposed to having the capacity within yourself of dealing with what life is. Um, and the older cultures or the cultural traditions are all about transmitting you're, you know, improving your ability of dealing with life. Yeah. And that is, that is fundamental. And that's what these fairy tales are doing. Um, yeah, because in a fairy tale, if you have an elder, if you have an old king or you have, you have the old woman and she's an adolescent, meaning she's behaving like an adolescent, the fairy tale will call that out. I mean, you will see that. And that, you know, it's like, no, you have a purpose here rise to it and that there you know i mean i think that we we do need not just because i'm an old woman but i do think we need to come back to venerating our elders and recognizing that there is something valuable there and not the quick fix of well okay boomer or whatever it is mm -hmm. <laughs> the uh, nieces and nephews say to me when i say these things wonderful next up is jp jp go ahead uh, this is excellent. Thank you. The uh, century before, children were learning to read and even think with old grammarian books that had quotations from spiritual writings to Shakespeare. And then 1930, Dick and Jane came along. <laughs> and then after that, about a decade later, we start getting Bugs Bunny and Wile E. Coyote. You mentioned Disney. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> If I could turn back the clock, you know, I mean, I heard I heard one report that Shakespeare was re being removed because he's an old dead white guy. I mean, oh, my God, are you serious? You know, the idea that cancel culture is taking many of these jewels and and, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I wish I had the answer. I would say the answer is. Read your, read your kids or your grandkids fairy tales and read them Shakespeare and read them poetry because it will awaken. I, I've got a little story. I was once at a, um, it's called a, a walkabout that when uh, the child is born, the grandmother gifts the baby moccasins, yet those moccasins have a hole in the soul because the idea is the ancestors haven't let this little one go yet. And so you better prove yourself. We'll give you a year and you better prove that you will love this little one or we're going to call it home. And then it's the grandmother is the trickster there saying, but surely you wouldn't ask them to make that journey back to the land of the dead with holes in their moccasins. So it just kind of gives a little bit of time. And then when the, when the child begins to walk, they are given new moccasins. So I was at a walkabout ceremony is when the new moccasins are given to the one-year-old or 16-month-old, however old the child is. And we're sitting in a circle and every person is making a blessing and speaking about what they hope for for this child and 
who they know the parents to be and what the community needs. And it was a very rich and beautiful ceremony. And there were kids on the floor. Well, I was like almost to the last when my turn was com coming. And you can smell the food cooking and the coffee is on. And I can hear it perking and everybody's tired. And what could you possibly say that hasn't already been said? And the kids are whining and crack cranky. And I, so, and I was giving a gift to the mother of a spinning wheel. And so I took the, the, the cloth off the spinning wheel and then I started. Once upon a time, there were 13 fairies, but there was only a place setting for 12. So one wasn't invited to the party. The kids stopped crying. They came and sat in front of me because as soon as you say, once upon a time, it takes us into some other place. And kids know that and they respond to that. And adults do too. Okay, I have to tell you a story, story too. So what um, I was visiting a friend and he had this daughter who was about three, who did not know English. Okay, but I wanted to communicate with her. So I was telling her stories, pantomiming all the fairy tale stories. Okay. Beautiful. She couldn't follow a word, but she was completely enthralled by it. And like a couple of days late, later, my friend calls me. She says, ever since you left, she was asking us what time it is. And I tried to tell her the time and then she would start crying. And she kept on doing that, what time it is. And then we figured out what she was asking for because all stories I would start with once upon a time. Once upon a time. <laughs> so that was her request for now tell me a story, <laughs> you know? And she was crying. Speak to that so once upon a time. Not, how can you not understand time? Uh, what's wrong with you? Uh, next, up is, next up is Evanique, followed by Madeline. Evanique. Yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, we were talking about uh, kids and uh, the simple fact that they're, you know, they're being a little more coddled than we were. And like me being Gen X, I, you know, I was, I was a latchkey kid. So that's like a, you know, for people that don't know, that's like a kid that lets themselves into the house at a very young age and knows what to do, do their homework, get some chores done, whatever. And I, what I hear a lot and what I see is that, you know, it's it's this lean towards more feeling and not hurting the kids' feeling because we were the generation that couldn't really express our feelings, right? Like you were suppressed, you know, people didn't have time to feel things. They were trying to, they were in survival mode, right? Like your parents, or at least our parents were in survival mode. And so... Like this whole thing of like kids could not feel like they could express themselves kind of reminds me of Young and the Shadow in that like, you know, first of all, you know, kids have very dark feelings. And when a lot of things are suppressed and, and a lot of dangerous things like molestation, like a lot of trauma is suppressed. How do you think that Jung would say to balance that with and then one thing is that a lot of Gen X people are proud of is that, you know, we were tough kids. Like we could, you know, we ran out and played all day and, you know, we knew how to deal with bullying. You know, we knew how to, if we were bullied, you knew how to fight back or otherwise you were going to keep getting the same behavior. But at the same time, it, it, it almost, you know, like Gen X is almost like this generation that can't be defined. Like we're kind of a, cold-hearted generation we've been stereotyped as and so I, I guess my question is is that how do you teach kids not only just to deal with or how do you think young would approach this or how does fairy tales approach teaching kids not only how to be tough and deal with problems and problem solve but also how to be able to express themselves so that they're not suppressing their feelings which also leads to having the darkness or having the shadow go uncontrolled and then expressing itself in certain ways like kids doing mass shootings and you know kids doing very dangerous things yeah, yeah. i mean that 
That, that is excellent. And what, what Jung said over and over again, well, first of all, he said he, he wouldn't analyze anybody under 25 years old. He said, I might as well just analyze the parents because until you're 25, you're basically carrying the unlived life of your parents. You know, what was unconscious in them is going to be picked up by the next generation. So he'd say he would get further by analyzing the parents rather than analyzing the child. But that's just, you know, a side point. But it, what we're speaking of is the objective and the subjective psyche. And we have both. You know, the objective psyche is the realm of the archetypal. The subjective psyche is the realm of my feelings and my lived experience. And so when we talk about the divine conjunctio, we're talking about the marriage of the objective psyche and the subjective psyche. I often tell my clients that, that feelings, emotions are like weather. And sometimes you batten down the hatches because the weather is really, really rough. But you wouldn't build your house based on the weather, you know, like you wouldn't. Oh, it's a rainy day, so I'm not going to build a house. No, you know, like you you learn to somehow be in the context of what you feel and continue to move towards some some objective truths or some objective goals. When we eclipse the objective reality with the subjective, then we're living out of the complexes. I would say for the first 10 years of my work as an analyst, I discovered, well, first of all, I was getting bored. And I'm thinking, what in the heck is wrong with you, Muriel? You spent all that money and all that time to study in Zurich and you're getting bored. But I realized what I was doing is I was analyzing the complex. That modern psychology tends to be in the customer satisfaction business. And you want your people to leave feeling good so they'll come back. I wasn't doing it consciously, but it was like the zeitgeist of the times. And when I realized that, I thought, no, when I make an archetypal translation, it should be uncomfortable. And people should leave feeling disturbed because if I'm taking the subjective experience of the complex and holding it up against the objective reality, then my job as an analyst is to give them an orientation. So if someone comes in and says to me, I had a dream last night that I was flying. Oh, it was such a wonderful dream. And I just loved it. And I could see everything. And I was so great. And I was just flapping my arms. To me as an analyst, that's alarming. Because it's like the complex, the manic defense is so present that they, the complex would have you believe you could fly away from all your problems as opposed to be on the ground and be in it. You know, if you, if, you know, so the first thing I would ask them, I need objective reality. Are you a pilot? And if they say, yeah, I'm a pilot. Okay, then you were flying. Were you in a Cessna? Were you in a 747? What were you flying? And they say, no, I don't fly. I was, I was flying with my body. Well, we got some work to do. So do you see what I mean? You're, you're taking the objective truth and you're looking at, and what does that truth look like from the point of view of the complex? So we need both. I need to know what people feel, what they think, but that's all subjective. And then I need to take that against what are objective truths, what are archetypal truths. And what are they? The fairy tales, the myths, great literature, great symphonies, they'll tell us what it is. Because what it will do is think of archetype as archetypically. So typically, this is what human beings do. You know, you could be incredibly unique, but typically. So then you're looking at your life against what is typical. Wonderful. Uh, next up is going to be Madeline followed by Joe, and then we will wrap it up. Madeline. Yes, thanks, Srikant, and thanks for putting this on. This is great. Uh, I'll be as succinct as I can. I want to take a brief journey into the darkness here. Uh, uh, please, uh, let, let's do it briefly, though. I will. It was what someone said earlier about climate change. And I think that we have actually bigger and longer term problems than climate change. Uh, and that is, uh, we're in quite a precarious situation in terms of the release of radioactive waste. Uh, you know what, let's and do, uh, Madeline, uh, that, that's a kind of a political question. Let's keep it aside for now. 
um let's uh let's uh, do you have any other question uh yeah actually i was going to talk about the dark woods but uh we'll skip that okay uh, well, next up, just let me make a comment that we are in a dark woods and we need to know the way through you know and sometimes i think what's interesting is that stories the time for stories is winter it's not summertime because ancient people knew that's when weather was rough that's when food was meager that's when we didn't know whether we would survive so they told stories to build hope one of the things i've noted about this you know post pandemic if in fact we are in the post pandemic people returning to a world that they no longer have faith in you know, they, they no longer have faith in medicine. They no longer have faith in science. They no longer have faith in political organizations. They no longer have faith in religion. And I'm speaking generally. So they're returning to a world that they no longer have faith in. And we can't live without faith. We can't live without hope. We can't live without dreams. So in the last two weeks, when these pictures of the, what is it, the James Webb telescope and it's like people are alive with hope again. Is that the hope of, you know, going to some distant galaxy or some greater wisdom visiting us? I don't care. It's a great fairy tale. It says that it's giving us hope to look beyond our current problems and see ourselves in, in a, the larger arc of a story. And I think that that's what we need, whatever the issues of our times, we need to say, and what endures? And what is the seed? As, as the storytellers tell us, when all when when the world is flooding, build an ark. Build an ark, preserve the instincts two by two, and save the seeds. And then when the waters recede and we see land again, then we build anew. Wonderful. Our last question is from Joe. Joe, go ahead. So I just, again, I wanted to say thank you for this evening, because this has actually been absolutely fabulous and, and, a, and a wonderful ending to the weekend uh, for me. I mean, it's just, but this has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. I have a really kind of um, just, it's kind of a basic question. I mean, I've taken storytelling classes uh, and I was just wondering, is there a way to be act to actually, uh, to take a I don't want to say take a class on fairy tales but at least learn how to 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 become a better storyteller of, of yeah. fairy tales specifically like because storytelling sometimes gets a little bit like Disney as we have we've talked about a little bit here um yeah anyway. well I'm, I'm inspired by your question Joe because maybe you will then in fact become a storyteller and and be a grave digger there's a wonderful group out of I think it's Yorkshire England it's called Storyversity Storyversity and it's like it's a it's like university online to teach you how to tell stories and it's brilliant they do some really lovely work there I am I, I need to develop my skills as a storyteller. You know, sometimes it's easier to do, you know, when I'm when I'm actually in the presence of people, because what you do as a storyteller is you take the frame of the story and you start to weave in the reality. I remember being at um at an indigenous ceremony one time and it was late and I was tired and and the elder started with this story may be true, this story may be false, this story tells a lie to reveal a truth. And I know he was just getting wound up. And I turned to somebody and I said, I've heard this story before. And he heard me, which was a very disrespectful thing for me to say. But he said, Muriel, of course you've not heard this story before. Joe wasn't here last time. And Roma wasn't here last time. And it wasn't July. Of course you didn't hear this story before. And it's the idea that the storyteller captures both the remote past and puts it in the context of the present, but doesn't avoid the shadow, doesn't avoid the dark times and tries not to get political, you know, tries to tell the story in a way that it speaks of universal truths and doesn't name political figures or, or 
specific problems that can be, you know, very polarizing. Let's let's take one more question. Sophia has not had a chance to ask a question. Uh, Sophia, go ahead. Thank you so much. I keep it very short. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, thank you really very much. So, my question for Muriel is that: What is your uh, recommendation for a scientist that just started to learn about the fairy tales, and it is extremely difficult because? My mind is used to build on uh, logical constructions and I, I cannot follow you all are talking about fairy tales and from this way and this way. If you can please uh, give me one or two suggestions, that would be great, thank you. Okay, I think that's the cutting edge. One of my students two years ago wrote a wonderful paper on the archetype of emergence, and she was a scientist. So she set it in the context of energy and the energetic system around entropy and perturbations and how, how energy acts. And she told the story of Tatterhood a brilliant piece of work that I've not seen done many places. So her name is uh, Cynthia Valentin. And I don't know if she's published her piece, but it was incredible because she had that scientific mind and she lost me on some of the physics, on some of the new science, but then she showed how the fairy tale Tatterhood. So, Sophia, if you were to find the Norwegian tale Tatterhood and read it from the point of view of the scientist, I think you'd know exactly how to do it, exactly how to find your way home. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Muriel. This was wonderful. Uh, I want to tell people about the two, two meetups we have coming up. Um, we are continuing our series on Carl Jung. It is turning out to be just amazing, amazing series. Um, Joe, can I request you to put a link to the Thursday meetup uh, in the chat? Uh, on Thursday, we're continuing to look at Jung's book, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. And we are going to be talking about stages of life. And each time I try to do something unusual, this time I'm going to draw the entire essay for you live. Um, so that's going to be, it's going to be in a form of a tree. You know, Jung talks about this sun moving in the arc, your childhood, your youth, young adulthood, then your middle age and your old age. And I'm going to try to draw all the problems that Jung talks about. And then we can talk about the, the solutions that Jung talks about. Jung talks about the solutions very briefly, but I'm going to connect it to another thinker who is who actually offers his own solution to the problem. So it will be a very interesting meetup. So don't miss that. That's on Thursday uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern time. On Monday, tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a meetup. Uh, we, we do poetry and collaborative poetry on Mondays. So I'm going to take a Marathi poetry. Marathi is a language I grew up speaking. I'm going to take a Marathi poem. That's the only thing that I came back, I spent two weeks in India. Before that, I used to get all kinds of goodies to eat from India whenever I came back, but this time I got a poem. So I'm gonna share that poem with you and I'm going to do a live translation of it. And we're gonna be discussing how metaphors work. And it'll be interesting viewpoint because you'll be looking at metaphors from another language and see, and see how they work. And to just pique your interest, it is going to compare a feather a peacock feather to Krishna, the God, and how a peacock feather and its characteristics can be used to understand, or talk about, not understand, but talk about uh, Krishna. So that's going to be the poem uh, tomorrow. So Muriel, this was just delightful. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I love your presentation. I love the repetition. I love the story. So thank you so much. Okay, and let me just leave you with this. I wish Please. you all good dreams, real dreams, and dreams are your personal fairy tales. So pay attention to them. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night Bye. Everybody. Bye.